coming up next on this episode of the Unlock You podcast. Exactly. Because what happens is he looks over at her, you know, 52%, 54% of the couples, the husband was the higher desire individual. Uh, 22% of them, they were the same. But if we take the stereotypical of the husband being the higher desire, he looks over and he says, wait, one to two times a week, how come we're not having it that often? Mm -hmm. And I look at him and say, that's the correct question. You know, that's the helpful question. Because when you look at your wife and you say, what's wrong with you that mm -hmm. you don't want sex enough? You know, the wife who comes in and says, you know, I'm an, I'm an attractive woman. Why doesn't my husband ever want me? There's something broken in him. There's something wrong in him. Mm -hmm. um, when we're blaming each other for that discrepancy, it really doesn't work. When we get to the same side and go, wait, we both want it more than what we're getting, which is what all of our research showed. Mm -hmm. um, then they can step back and say, what's getting in the way? And now we can start to truly problem solve the energy crisis. We can solve the, I don't feel attended to, or I feel too criticized or whatever is truly yeah. getting in the way of both of us uh, pursuing what we would like. Welcome to Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. And we have the amazing privilege of being with the renowned sex therapist of our age. Dr. Michael Seisma is amazing. So over 2,400 hours of training in sex therapy and over 30 years of experience as a sex therapist. And he's the co-author of Secrets of Sex and Marriage, Eight Surprises That Make All the Difference. It is such a privilege to be with you today. Thank you. It's such an honor to be with you as well. Thanks. And we just had your co-author Shanti Feldhahn on, and that was super uh -huh. fun. So now we're going to dive in and ask you about sex discrepancy. So many people Great. love each other. They want to be to con connected. And yet there's these weird glitch moments in sexual compassion and intimacy and desire and all the things. So lay it on us. Where are we at and how do we help that? Good. Well, the first thing that I would point out is you're starting with probably the most commonly mm -hmm. asked question, the, the greatest uh, arena of sexual pain for couples. Mm -hmm. uh, in my dissertation over 20 years ago, this is what I studied. Um, it was called sexual desire discrepancy in married couples. And I looked at what's going on and asked uh, all of these couples, how much pain there was in their relationship based on sexual desire. And over half of the couples, this was a non-clinical sample, uh, over half of the couples said that the pain was so great that they've considered talking to a professional mm -hmm. um, about the desire discrepancy. So we know there's a lot of pain in couples around this issue. Why don't you want it as much as I do? Or why do you want it so much? Um, and, and, the research, the marriage intimacy project that we completed for this book, uh, 70, almost 80%, 78% of the couples disagreed in how much they wanted. Okay. Uh, but when we asked couples in uh, the largest uh, survey that we've got there, uh, 501 couples, uh, one that I'm really proud of is matched pair. In other words, we ask both the husband and the wife so we can compare their answers. We can ask the husband, how much, how often do you think your wife would like to have sex? And then ask the hus the wife, how often would you? Uh -huh. And see what the difference is in those. And what we found is that couples aren't near as far apart as what they expect they are going to be. Couples are much closer in what they would like uh, than they usually think. Uh, oh. what we call an attribution error, you know, mm -hmm. in our, in our field. Yeah. And the more distress there is, the further apart they are. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple sitting in my office, uh, this typical couple, I'll look at her and say, in fact, this happened yesterday in session. I looked at her and said, if it were totally up to you about how often would you like to engage sexually with your husband? And she says one, maybe twice a week. And I look at him and I say, how often would you? And he says, two to three. And she looks over and goes, uh, uh, you want it every day at least. And he says, and you never want it. <laughs> and the reality is there's a huge difference between daily and never, mm -hmm. but they're both, I looked at him and said, you both are saying twice a week. There's not much difference between two and two. And that, 
that truth right there is just huge for couples to to understand. They're probably when it comes down to it, not as far apart as what they they think they are. Right. And so by feeling that we're far apart, then we can kind of tug a war and pull to our different sides rather than moving to the middle and finding that median of two rather than never or always. Exactly. Because what happens is he looks over at her, you know, 52%, 54% of the couples, the husband was the higher desire individual. Uh, 22% of them, they were the same. But if we take the stereotypical of the husband being the higher desire, he looks over and he says, wait, one to two times a week, how come we're not having it that often? Mm -hmm. And I look at him and say, that's the correct question. You know, that's the helpful question. Because when you look at your wife and you say, what's wrong with you that -hmm. you don't want sex enough? You know, the wife who comes in and says, you know, I'm an, I'm an attractive woman. Why doesn't my husband ever want me? There's something broken in him. There's something wrong in him. Mm -hmm. Um, When we're blaming each other for that discrepancy, it really doesn't work. When we get to the same side and go, wait, we both want it more than what we're getting, which is what all of our research showed. Mm -hmm. Um, Then they can step back and say, what's getting in the way? And now we can start to truly problem solve the energy crisis. We can solve the, I don't feel attended to, or I feel too criticized or whatever is truly getting in the way of both of us uh, pursuing what we would like. And how do you help couples foster that initial conversation? Because the subtext is there, the no, I have a headache conversation, but we're really Uh not usually talking about the real thing. How do you help couples have more of an authentic conversation around sex that's productive? Uh, That is kind of a key question. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, in my office, that is my task is to help draw that out. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll ask a husband his answers and knowing that the wife is listening. I'm I'm not asking because I need to know. I'm asking because she needs to know. Mm-hmm. And then I'll ask her for him. And I get them comfortable talking to me. And then I turn them toward each other and mm-hmm. get them talking with each other. For couples at home who don't have a therapist that's sitting in the midst of them drawing it out, honestly, that's a big part of what the book is written for and why Shanti was able to talk me into doing it. (laughs) Yes, is it's written for couples to sit down and read out loud to each other Mm -hmm. and to pause and talk about the book, you know, to pause and say, that that's just stupid. He, he's way off base. Nobody's ever like that. And to have her husband look over at her and go, wait, I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I work. And that happens so much. And the book gives them the language and gives them the topics to start to mm-hmm. talk about. Of Obviously, a lot of couples, both of them aren't going to be open to that type of a process. Yeah. Um, so maybe one of them reads it to the other, or maybe they drop the uh, audio book Um, in the car when they're taking a trip and pause Mm -hmm. it regularly to talk about it. Or maybe one reads it and says, hey, I was reading this book, they said, and that allows them to start having deeper conversations about the discrepancy. This says that most women want, this says that most men want, what what are you like? You know, Mm -hmm. this is, this says that most couples misunderstand each other's desire types and desire levels what are you like? And that helps couples to begin the the conversation around it, which is is huge in helping them to to come together and decrease the discrepancy and de- decrease the distress that they have. Yeah, absolutely. Because mm-hmm. normally I think most people want to keep the peace. So we just don't say anything and we just kind exactly. of swallow, 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 and then resentment and disappointment and shame and feeling unattractive. All these things are building on the inside that we're not actually right. addressing together. So by the time it comes out, it's usually passive, ag- passive aggressive or it's resentment or it's ugly. And so right. I'm I'm not getting my heart question asked, am I attractive? Do you respect me? Do you love me? I'm do you now want just, me? Do you yes. want me? Mm-hmm. Instead, we're just kind of attacking and launching. And from that place, now, of course, you're going to get a bad reaction. Of right. course, you're going to get the negative to whatever that heart question is. And so I love the soft approach, the proactive. And obviously, I'm biased as a therapist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope people do go. I hope you hear this and you're like, why would we not invest in our marriage? We 
invest at work. We get continuing right. education. We are constantly doing checkups on our car and our health and our kids. And we're spending thousands of dollars on soccer and on sports and athletics and all these things. Why would we not invest in our marriage to just proactively have these conversations and save so much pain and heartache? Right. Yep. And you brought up an important point there that I spend a, quite a bit of time with my couples on, and that is intentionality, mm -hmm. that we are intentional in so many areas of our life. This is one that there's value in being intentional with. Yeah. But like you said, it's central to our hearts that we easily get wounded there. Mm -hmm. And for many of the couples that I work with, they have really good marriages, except this arena. Mm -hmm. And so when they start to fight about it, they back away from each other because we don't want to mess up what's really good here. Mm -hmm. um, and they go three more months and not talking about it. But each time they do that, the frequency drops another, mm -hmm. you know, minor notch until, yeah. until we're in trouble. Um, yeah. So being intentional and keep leaning, keeping proactive is very important. Yeah. And for those who think that sex isn't that important, you know, like usually one person is mm -hmm. more the initiator, more than the others, the receiver. For those that are listening that are like, hey, is it really even that big of a deal? Why do you think sex in marriage is important? For a couple of reasons. Um, one is, uh, and Shanti put it in the book, she heard me talking about it, and she, um, that you bring two people together uh, in that intimate of a relationship, there is going to be friction mm -hmm. just because we don't have the same mind. You know, we know in our field that having couples that are divergent is, is really actually helpful for the marriage as long as they accept influence from each other. But it does create friction. And sex is one of the things that helps to kind of put the oil into the system and reduces the heat from that friction. Um, John Gottman calls a positive sentiment override that, you know, we look at our spouse and say, you, you really hurt my feelings and what you just said or what you just did, but you can make me feel really good. So we'll ignore it this time. You know, that sense of we can play with each other. We feel nurtured by each other. We feel profoundly, intimately connected mm -hmm. in a way that we don't with anybody else yeah. helps us to be each other's person mm -hmm. and, and to know that we are together in this. So even when we bicker, it's okay because we like each other. We have fun together. We bring pleasure to each other and we receive pleasure from each other. So I think that's a, a huge um, part of it. The other aspect of it is it is so sacred. We don't share this with anybody else. Mm -hmm. Nobody else gets to know the way I like to be touched that profoundly. Mm -hmm. Nobody else gets to learn the, the pattern that you enjoy um, as my wife. And so we share this profound secret that nobody else gets to know. You know, and I'm always, always so tentative when I'm asking couples in therapy because I tell them this is sacred information. It's none of my business, but I have to ask them these questions to help you. But watching this um, sacred information that is only shared between them helps to create a, a rich, um, precious boundary around them that helps them to view, view themselves as uh, as an us versus the other. And I think that's really rich for couples. That's so good. And earlier you had said it's just reserved for the two of us. So yes. what do you think is the impact of introducing porn and other things that our culture has said is normal and doesn't make mm -hmm. a difference? It's just a stress relief. All guys do it or all girls do it. It could be on either side. Uh -huh. And we could also include romance novels as part of the girl side <laughs> of emotional uh -huh. porn. Um, so why, why do you think that matters what we're allowing and entertaining even in our imagination if we're not doing something physically? Let me start by saying, you know, this is tough to research. It's tough mm -hmm. to study. And so the research studies around that question tend to give divergent answers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's because of how we assess what is and is not porn. Sometimes it's the intensity of the, the images that are being viewed or the regularity. Uh, more often, it's what goes along with the pornography, what types of behaviors mm -hmm. um, we're doing. So some research says it's actually maybe beneficial to couples. Most of it, though, including one that just came out that was really well done, um, says that 
the addition of pornography into the relationship tends to tear at that um, central core of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, it is that fact of bringing something else in. Mm -hmm. You know, if the, I tend to think God's design was that the first time we ever experience that profound rush of pleasure is with our spouse looking deep into their eyes. And the only time we ever experience that profound rush of pleasure is looking into our spouse's eyes. If we protected and preserved that, if they were the only source of our sexual pleasure, I think we'd like them even more. (laughs) (laughs) That Wait, you're the only one that does that for me. Um, The only one that we do that together. When we bring in other images, we can't not begin comparing. Mm -hmm. We can't not begin thinking about what it would be like with that person versus what we have. Mm -hmm. Um, We can't begin comparing ourselves. We can't be not have these expectations of what is going on there that I would like. And now we're bringing something else in that is more often than not destructive. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had a couple, you know, when I go out and do workshops and seminars, I invite them to do, um, kind of anonymous Q and a, um, and I just flipped through the question cards and one of the question cards came in and there were two questions on it written in the same flowing hand. And the first one was, um, what's wrong with my husband and I viewing pornography when we both agree we're doing it together, Mm -hmm. um, to give us ideas and to kind of get the process started. And the second question was, how do I husband, how do I help my husband to view me as more than just parts? And I said, asked and answered, you know, pornography has a focus of um, pleasure, um, of parts, of technique, and a sex life that's focused on pleasure, parts, and technique is not a healthy sex life. Yeah. It's going to derail the couple over time. Mm-hmm. A couple that's focused on pleasure, but within the context of rich connection and the spiritual intimacy, what in chapter 10 um, I talk about is the incarnational sex. Um, a, a sex life that's focused on those heart issues mm-hmm. is a rich sex life. And that's totally different goal than pornography brings in. And so when we bring pornography in, we have competing goals. And because of the intensity of it, it's easy for for it to pull us off track of our spouse and the attention to them and the connection and the unique oneness that a rich sex life can provide for a couple. Yeah. Because to your point, if we're having sex just for immediate gratification of self, we're not truly making love to the whole person. And so the danger of, for females in particular, who go into fantasy books and movies and all of that, I would argue it's the same, that males may be more visual. So porn has more of a visual component with the act of sex, but it's still a fantasy of somebody who worships me and thinks I'm amazing and never tells me to pick up my socks or that I haven't done something (laughs) right. And I don't have to go get the kids one more time and mow the lawn. We can go into fantasy and then it's all about self and gratification rather than truly learning how to fall in love and make love body, soul, and spirit. So what are your thoughts along those lines of how we're giving pieces of our heart to fantasy that then we're not reserving it for our spouse and then they'll naturally look lackluster when you live with them every day? Definitely. And like you're saying, it distracts us to those parts as opposed to leaning in and truly cherishing the heart of each other. Yeah. And you know, as we get older, that even has a greater impact Mm -hmm. because if sex is focused on parts, it's focused on techniques, it's focused on fantasy. As our bodies get older, both as males and females, Mm -hmm. our our bodies don't always show up to the party. Our our bodies don't always behave the way we want them to. And if sex has been about parts and technique, I watch with deep sadness, these couples give up on engaging sexually Mm -hmm. because my body's no longer reliable. And I, I don't know for sure that I'm going to get aroused. I don't know for sure it's going to work. And so Mm -hmm. out of fear and shame, I just choose not to engage. Mm -hmm. And 
And I'm so sad for that because Mm -hmm. sex is so much more than what the pornography taught them. Mm -hmm. If it's about leaning in and pursuing each other's hearts. You know, I've looked at so many guys and said, the depth of who your wife is, you will never, ever be able to plumb those depths fully. If you keep leaning into it in those sacred, intimate moments, her body, you'll run out of things that you can do. Your body, you can run, you'll run out of things that you can do. That's, that's honoring to each other. But when you make that time about pursuing each other's hearts, there's no, no limit to the creativity, no limit to the, the intimacy that you can experience. And so what if your parts don't show up, you know, okay, that's a bummer, but it doesn't have to even distract you from the goal Mm -hmm. where if the goal is what, you know, images and uh, reading fantasy stories and um, erotic novels, or if it's what all of that has taught us, then we stop engaging sexually and we lose track of, of the beauty of it. Oh, I love that. And so for anyone who's listening right now and they're starting to reassess how much am I just trying to get through the motions or just, you know, mark it off the checklist and they've lost sight of the beauty of actually making love to the whole person. Mm-hmm. How would you recommend that people start moving back toward wholehearted love? Um, I like to take couples, you know, um, in Revelation, Christ is talking to his bride and he says, you know, uh, love you that you've stayed committed. Um, you've fallen out of the passion of love and he gives her a recipe. He says, remember the heights from which you've fallen, repent and go do those things again. So we have the remember, repent and do. And I do that with couples. Go back to when you were dating. You know, you had early on probably set some kind of boundaries for your physical intimacy, but man, you walked right up to those boundaries and you (laughs) might've spent an hour and a half, two hours just drinking in each other. And how long does that kind of sensual play happen now? And couples go, I don't know, 30 seconds, you know, two (laughs) minutes (laughs) because we get right to the act. Yeah. Let's back that down. And let's take some times where we actually set the having sex off the table and let's just go make love. Let's just go engage in this rich making out type of behavior and relearn what it's like to deeply connect with each other in each other's bodies without having the sex be the goal. Mm-hmm. And as couples step back and they begin working on what I call working the whole curve, they relearn what it's like to intimately connect with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, Then they can talk about what they do and they don't like and what helps them to feel closer and more intimate versus helps them to feel more erotically turned on. Both of those are good, Mm -hmm. but let's make sure we're attending to both. And in our society, I think the art form of actually making the person feel safe and loved and emotionally turned on, not just physically and erotically, is almost lost art. So can you speak more to the difference and how to cultivate both sides? Yeah. um, So in my office, I actually, and in the workshops, I do the same thing. I'll have a couple set in front of me and I'll have her place her hand on a pillow between them or one of their legs and have him begin to just caress her hand. And we talk through what kind of sensations he is experiencing. And he'll talk about the warmth of her hand and he'll talk about the the bones that he can feel right under the skin or the muscles. Um, the one, one husband was talking about the squishy skin over her knuckles or the slickness of her nails and how small her hand felt and how how um, fragile, um, yet how strong it was for all that it did for the family. And beginning to really be aware of the internal and the physical sensations. And then for her, as she's receiving it, talking about the strength of his hand and, and what it's like to be touched. And, and then I have them reverse roles after about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And 20 minutes sit in my office, and all they're doing is caressing hands and talking about what they're experiencing and it gets really intimate. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I don't belong here any longer. And, (laughs) you know, the couple's talking about how this is such an intimate behavior. And all we're doing is touching hands, you know, the least intimate part of our, of our bodies will, will shake any stranger's hand, we'll extend that. 
And yet that touch in that context with that mm. focus is profoundly intimate. Mm. And I have couples do that three times a week for you know several weeks and really learn how to tune into the touch of each other before they move to a face caress or feet caress or leg caress. And they really learn how to drink in the sensations and attune to one another receiving the pleasure and giving the pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they get to where they're touching more erotic zones, they have really truly learned how to tune into one another. Yeah. And, and it's not so goal focused of let's get to the orgasm. Let's get to the apex of this event. It's more, let's connect and find a, a type of oneness through the mm -hmm. process um, where we're drinking each other in. Oh, I love that. And so go back to the part you were saying about the curve. How do you invite couples into that? So um, I pulled this from Desmond Morris, who's an anthropologist, uh, looked at couples and said, you know, how do they pair bond? How do they connect? Mm -hmm. And um, so he's looking at couples from a variety of different cultures. And he came up with 12 different steps that he says all humans do. And he says, it starts with eye to body that we look over and go, <laughs> she's cute or wow, look at those shoulders and, you know, look at that smile, look at those eyes. And then we're, we're eye to eye as we, you know, do you see me? Do you recognize me? Um, are you a good person in there? Um, and we do hand to hand and then, and we, he walks through the different types of touch that we have hand to shoulder, hand to, to lower back you know, um, it, we're different kinds of um, hugs all the way through to where we're genital to genital touch. And I point out to my couples that most couples go from you know, voice to voice and jump all the way to step 12, genital to genital. And they skip all of these steps in between that are yeah. so rich. Mm. Um, uh, total intimacy by Doug Rose and all and Deborah Neal give another pathway to it. There are a variety of different models um, that help couples to see there's an entire cycle here mm -hmm. that allow us to slow down. Um, but this, what I use comes from a celebration of sex by Doug Rose and all, and it gives all 12 of those. Yeah. And I just walk couples through them and slow them down um, with mm -hmm. it. So say that as a resource again, I think a lot of our listeners would love that. Yes, yeah, Celebration of Sex by mm -hmm. Douglas Rosenall. Um, and he got permission from Desmond Morris to put those 12 steps in there and to talk about them. I love it. This is mm -hmm. so valuable. So we have like one minute left. Is there anything you would leave our audience with? You know, this is an arena that good practice, good study, good attending to one another, being curious about one another is well worth the energy that goes into it, being intentional to just, we want this to be good. Let's figure it out together. Let's keep working on it. It's, yeah. it's well worth it. And it's well worth it. Because I think in our culture, we're used to microwave instant gratification. So if this isn't working, we get another partner, we get another, partner, right. we get another, you know, but that long term investment, what have you seen for those couples that have weathered the storm and they stayed bonded, even after a long, long time, and what you see in their satisfaction, even sexually as well yes. as emotionally? Well, one of my mentors used to say that you can't truly have a great sex life until you've been together for at least 30 years. <laughs> um, he, he believed that it took that kind of understanding of one another and acceptance of self and each other. And I watched that happen for couples. They no longer have an 18 year old body, but they have such a rich connection with each other that is so admirable. Yeah. Um, one 70 year old guy said, you know, at 70, um, he said, my parts don't always show up to the party, but it, it doesn't <laughs> matter. He said, I am having the best sex of my life. Mm -hmm. And it's because he had learned how to truly, intimately, deeply, richly connect with his wife. And she said the same thing. You know, early on, sex was about pressure and about performance mm -hmm. and about all these things that wasn't helpful. Yeah. And today it's about just enjoying one another. And that's what I see happen. And and that takes work for couples to get through all of the ickiness of our immaturity. So. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> and it's so worth it. Thank you it so is. much, Dr. Seisma. This has been such a privilege. And for those out there, Secrets of Sex and Marriage, Eight Surprises That Make All the Difference. And you can go to secretsofsexandmarriage.com for more articles, right. resources, and even finding a good sex therapist in your area. Yes. We love you guys. Thank you for joining us for this episode. And we'll see you for the next one. Bye, Thank guys. You.